Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Darvish from Holistic Naturopathic Medical Center. I am the founder and chief medical officer at Holistic here in Bellevue. And we are talking about women's health. We're just waiting for Dr. Marion to join us uh, in just a few minutes. But we wanted to talk about um, women's health because it is a very important topic uh, regards to how we take care of ourselves and um, how we eat and drink and um, exercise and practice all that good stuff to keep our hormones balanced. So this is one of the biggest keys is how do we keep our hormones balanced in order to maintain symptom free and help our body detoxify well. So um, let's start. I'm going to start until Dr. Marion joins us. And when she does, it'll be great. So estrogen is one of the biggest uh, issues that we often face in North America. Most of us are estrogen dominant, whether we are premenopausal, or menopausal or postmenopausal, estrogen plays a big, big role. And uh, it is a very inflammatory condition. It is uh, something that uh, will cause fibroids, PMS, um, endometriosis, and a whole load of other estrogen related conditions. So most of the time when we're moody, when we have uh, PMS symptoms, hormonal issues, estrogen is what the problem is in terms of having too much of estrogen and not enough progesterone. And there are three different types of estrogen. There is uh, what we call the E1, E2, E3. I like to call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, E3 is the good guy, E2 is the mediocre guy, and E1 is the uh, hormone that is most toxic and most inflammatory. It is also the hormone that is mostly um, found in post, um, post menopause, and it is the E2 that is often prescribed for menopausal symptoms. But the problem with E2 is that it can also cause some issues with, um, it can, E2 can cause issues with inflammation. So we have to be really careful with what type of hormones we are dealing with. Nevertheless, we've got these hormones, these estrogens, and these estrogens have to go through a detoxification process. And these estrogens go through a detox phase one and phase two in the liver, and then go through what's called a phase three in the gut. Now, I like to think of these phases as um, phase one being something like you're getting the toxins out of your cabinets, you're cleaning out those cabinets and closets. Phase two, is uh, when we're packing them up in boxes. And phase three is when we get them out of the boxes and um, we get them out of the boxes and then we are, um, no, getting them out of the house. Dr. Marion's here on Instagram, but I'm not seeing you on Facebook yet, Doc. Can you hear me? Oh, she's having a little bit of an issue uh, on hearing me. Oh, she needs to show up here. So we're just having some technical issues. She needs to show up here first. So she, she's been invited. She needs to go into her, into her link. I'm not sure if she's gone into her link. Anyway, sorry about all that chit chat on the background, trying to figure out why I can't hear Dr. Marion, um, she needs to be going on Facebook so I can hear her a little bit better. So anyhow, so the idea is that we're going to pack these estrogens and get them out, and that is through the colon. So phase one and two is done in the liver, and then phase three is through the colon. And so if you're missing some nutrients like magnesium, vitamin B6, 
um, B12, um, something called N-acetylcysteine, glutathione production. All of that will affect the way the liver is detoxifying some of these hormones. And then uh, when we go to uh, phase three, which is the colon, we want to make sure that you have enough good bacteria in your in your gut, that the microbiome, we spent a few sessions in, in the past looking at the microbiome and um, looking to see how that will impact the gut. So the microbiome is super, super important. Let me see here if I've got, Dr. Marion, can you hear me? Okay, I think they're having some technical issues. So anyhow, if anybody's got any questions, by the way, please uh, go online and give me a little message and I will be more than happy to, um, to respond to your messages or any questions that you have. So we're just waiting for Dr. Marion to go online and uh, I'm glad that we've got some people coming in on Facebook listening in. Anyhow, so we are looking at the estrogen as a big issue with some of these chronic diseases um, with PMS and endometriosis. So there is there are many diets that um, you can look up regarding um, the uh, estrogen dominance. And typically I have people go on more of a low animal fat diet because think about it, animals have hormones, right? Especially cows. And so every time you are eating animal product, you're actually ingesting some of those extra hormones, especially the estrogens. And that is adding to your estrogen load on your system and causing a more inflammatory issue on your body uh, and promoting the growth of endometriosis or fibroids or some of these hormone related conditions. So I usually have people go on a very low animal fat diet, an animal protein diet, uh, and that helps quite a bit with balancing some of this estrogen. If you're premenstrual and you are having some PMS issues, it may not be only um, that you are having um, uh, too much estrogen, but it can also be that you're having low progesterone. And the progesterone is super important for um, your well being, for the PMS balancing, for reducing the estrogen dominance in your body and balancing out the. Um, progesterone and the estrogen issues. So sometimes we put people on, um, women on um, seed cycling, different seeds like flax seeds is used mainly in the beginning of the cycle. And then more of the pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds later on in, or sesame seeds later on in the half of the cycle. And this is mainly because it, the difference seeds will have different kind of hormone effects. And so if we are doing more of the pro progesterone during the second half of the cycle, you're going to increase the progesterone levels and hopefully reduce the estrogen levels. If you are doing flax seeds throughout the month, you may actually be making more estrogen uh, in the second half of the cycle when we want less estrogen in the second half. So there is, uh, there is definitely an important uh, way of cycling these seeds, uh, flaxseed beginning of the cycle, sesame seeds or pumpkin seeds in the second half. And I am getting Dr. Marianne here on Facebook. Let me see if I can bring her on. This is very exciting. There you are, Doc. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You want to turn up? I think she's having a hard time hearing me. Are you? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Fantastic. Okay, we finally got it rolling. You're on Facebook and Instagram Live. 
Mm-hmm. Welcome, Dr. Marion. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Marion is an associate of mine who's been with me for about three plus years, actually probably more like 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> initially as a patient and then as a resident physician and now as an associate and we love having her she's an engineer of a mind and a uh, heart of gold so she's got the both best of both uh, systems in her being and a beautiful spirit so dr marion we've been talking about estrogen and estrogen detox and seed cycling and uh i think that's as far as we got Okay. So, on woman's health. <laughs> and what was the last thing you said? Woman's, woman's health. Oh, good. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, by the way, I'm hoping that none of you guys out on Instagram are um, getting a reverberation. Are you getting a reverberation or is it sounding pretty okay? You can hear both of us. Give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm sure somebody would uh, hopefully say something if they got, it says it's okay. So that's good. Fantastic. Good. Okay, Dr. Marianne, do you want to give us some uh, info about what you were thinking about women's health? Yeah, so I just want to start by um, talking about the naturopathic principles, because I think that really is underlying how we approach conditions of women's health. Um, and the first one is primum non nocere in Latin, and that translates to first do no harm. So oftentimes we're thinking about um, how can we support a woman's health without causing any toxicity, any added toxicity or, or imbalance or harm the person in any way. The second principle is vis medicatrix nature, which is translated to the healing power of nature. Um, and truly this means that um, the natural drive of nature is to heal. When you chop a leaf off a plant, it grows a new one. When you um, do something to nature, the, the natural process is to move towards healing. And humans are nature. We are living organisms and our natural drive is to heal. And so if we remove the obstacles or the barriers to cure, the body will naturally move towards healing. And so sometimes that remove, that means removing um, a habit or a, a unhealthy diet or an environmental toxin or some other type of barrier to healing, then the body naturally moves towards health um, and less medications and drugs are needed. Um, the third principle is identify and treat the cause. This is tole causum in Latin. Um, and so we are often with women's health, especially, but all conditions, we are seeking to understand what is driving the condition and what is creating um, the imbalance in the body. And so really make, paying attention to um, these pieces that are creating the imbalance in the body. Then the fourth principle is docere, which is doctor as teacher. And so we are often teaching a woman about her hormones because women's hormones are quite complex. It's not quite as stable and um, unchanging as, as men's health. I'm getting a lot of feedback, by the way, but I hope you aren't, Dr. Darvish. No, um, I'm, I'm good. I'm sorry you're okay. getting that. No, no, that's okay. I think I can tolerate just as long as that's not showing up on this on the feed. But um, so doctor and teacher, women's health, we're, we're complex beings. We are beautiful, mysterious complex organisms and our hormones are changing throughout the month, at least premenstrually. And so a big piece of um, naturopathic medical care is um, educating a woman on her, um, on her natural cycling of hormones and what should be going on in a normal organism. Um, and I think a big part of this is that the first half of a woman's cycle should be more outgoing, should be more driven, should be more energetic. The second half of a woman's cycle should be more inward, um, more internal, less energetic, and more restful. And that's really natural and normal to cycle between the two. And that can help women with understanding their own bodies and seeing, you know, sometimes what you would think of as a symptom as more of just a natural cycle. Um, the fifth principle is totally totem, which is treat the whole person. Um, and when we say treat the whole person, we mean not focusing in on any individual organ. So we're never just looking at the thyroid or the uterus or the adrenal glands or the brain. We're looking at the whole system as a whole and as a 
um, combination of the parts and no one part um, individually. And then the sixth principle, um, and sorry, let me just go back. That's important with women's health because if we do focus on just the uterus or on just the pituitary gland, then you're ignoring the communication that happens between all of those organs. So there's a message that goes from the brain um, down to the genital organs to create hormones and to create cycle. And then there's feedback from those hormones back to the brain to say, hey, I need more hormones or I need less hormones. And any part of that process can be imbalanced. So if we're not looking at the, the system as a whole, then we are ignoring the fact that there's um, interplay between those between those parts. And then the sixth principle is prevention, health, and wellness. Um, really, prevention is the most important one, and the Latin term is pre prevenic. Um, and that means that we are often um, focusing on how can we prevent illness. And really, the best system of healthcare is if the, if the illness is never created to begin with. So we're looking at prevention of breast cancer, prevention of ovarian cancer, prevention of diabetes, of cardiovascular disease, of chronic health conditions, and really making sure that the healing or, or holistic pieces are in place to make sure that those conditions are prevented so that um, really treatment never even has to occur for those diseases. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of sort of the naturopathic approach um, with specifically a focus on how we would approach women's health conditions. That's awesome. Thank you for going back to the beginning of our medicine. And this is really the essence of why I went into naturopathic medicine was because uh, I find that the body has the wisdom to heal. And all we need to do is get out of the way and allow the wisdom of the body to take over and do the healing and give it what it needs. So whether it's good food or good nutrition or exercise or fresh air and oxygen, a good sleep, water, you know, all of the basics, then you're promoting uh, the, the basic um, building blocks for the body to do its work to heal and regenerate and rejuvenate. And, um, and education is a big part of it, definitely. And this is one of the main reasons we do this here um, or have been doing it for the past few months on um, Instagram and Facebook is to educate. And uh, I believe that that is an obligation that we have as physicians is to learn and then to pass it on and help inspire and uh, help encourage our patients to take care of themselves. So, you know, that's, that's the other aspect of this, right? Is that from a Western medicine perspective, the doctor tells you do this and you do it and they say, don't do this and you don't do it. And um, there is no empowerment involved with the patient. We give, they give a prescription, you go home, you take it, and you hope that you get a quick fix. Whereas here, what we are really trying to do is um, give the body and the person some education and the tools it needs to empower itself to drive that engine, to drive that car and get it to well-being. So thank you for, for bringing that to to uh, forefront again, Dr. Marion. So mm -hmm. I just spoke about, you know, the estrogens, the E1, E2, 3, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the phase one, phase two, phase three detoxification, and, and how important that is in um, PMS symptoms and fibroids and endometriosis, and a lot of chronic and acute symptoms that we as females face throughout our lifetime. So Maybe going back and discussing a little bit more about phase one and phase two detox, um, any thoughts as to uh, what else we can do? I was, I was talking a little bit earlier about using more of a plant-based diet versus an um, animal-based diet to help the detoxification system and to help reduce the load on the estrogen system in the body. So what... Uh, and, and we mentioned magnesium and glutathione for phase two um, detox. So maybe you can uh, yeah. expand on that a little bit more. Sure. So um, what Dr. Darvish is mentioning with regard to phase one and phase two metabolism are processes that happen in the liver. And these are both detox processes. Um, and basically things including toxic estrogen metabolites and estrogens themselves, as well as other toxins, will move through these processes in the liver. And each 
process requires different nutrients, so different B vitamins and different other different micronutrients. And so each of those steps can be um, held up by a nutrient deficiency or by um, an overwhelming amount of toxins to be metabolized. So sometimes what happens is that you will focus or the provider will focus on phase one metabolism um, and not necessarily support phase two metabolism. And what can happen is then a backup of the in-between metabolites and that can feel sort of toxic. And so you really wanna look at, at both phases um, when you're talking about detox. And definitely a plant-based um, diet can be helpful uh, for a lot of reasons. A big one because there's a lot of fiber in plant-based foods. And so when our body is getting rid of um, toxic estrogen metabolites, they are placed into the gut uh, for them to be removed with the fiber that you are then removing with bowel movements. And so if you're not eating a lot of fiber, those metabolites, those estrogens can get reabsorbed in the large intestine with all of the water that's getting reabsorbed. So you want good, strong binders, which is often fiber. Um, right. So that's, uh, that's, I was initially talking about how we box it up and that's phase two and we want to get it out of the house. So what fiber does is it becomes your vehicle to get it out of the house, get those toxins out of the house, right? And then we also mentioned microbiome and, and how we've talked about in the last a few sessions about the importance of microbiome being a component of that phase three detoxification. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, um, so going back to phase one and phase two, uh, the overload of the estrogen on the system, mm -hmm. right? The overload of the estrogen. And oftentimes I think there's things in our lifestyle and diet that are overloading the estrogen. And that includes, for instance, eating uh, or drinking water out of plastic bottles or microwaving food and plastic. And these plastics have xenoestrogens that contribute to the estrogenic overload. Mm -hmm. So it is very important for females who are uh, experiencing premenstrual syndrome, tension or endometriosis, fibroids, uh, any kind of uh, bloating, uh, any kind of hormonal related issue that it's more likely than not an estrogen dominance and it's good to make sure that you're avoiding some of these toxic chemicals and estrogens that are found in our food and uh, lifestyle practices. Yeah, so what Dr. Darvish is mentioning is something called xenoestrogens, which means um, chemical constituents that act like estrogen in the body. And so yes, plastics are play a big role, but definitely phthalates, which is really hard to pronounce, but it's P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-S, phthalates, um, alkaphenols, and then everybody knows BPA or bisphenol A. All of those can act like estrogen in the body. And so because a lot of women's health conditions are driven by an excess amount of estrogen and an overly signaled estrogen system, we often talk about removing those. But some other areas of um, really important you know, estrogens to identify are food processing um, and pesticide chemicals, as well as cosmetics being a big one. So definitely That's a big one. making That's sure a your cosmetics one. are clean, absolutely. Right? Um, and, and then some heavy metals. Sorry, Doc. Body That's care right. products. Yeah. Body care yeah. products. You know, we don't think of all the creams and lotions that we put on ourselves. And majority of those chemical, those creams have chemicals in them. And so you've got, you're putting on chemicals on your body that are getting absorbed. And we don't think that stuff gets absorbed through our skin. But guys, you know what? We give hormone therapy through the skin and then we measure it in the blood and the urine. So we know these chemicals get absorbed through the skin. So I beg you, please get off of any kind of creams and lotions and makeup, hair products, um, hairsprays, anything that's got chemicals in it that you cannot pronounce or understand, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? The environmental working group, ewg.org has a great resource um, for looking up whether your personal care products are more toxic or, or less. So that's a great resource. Yeah, chlorines, um, chlorines being mentioned and chlorine, mm -hmm. um, yeah. bromide, you know, in hot tubs, people think, oh, I'm going to go sit in my hot tub and do some hydrotherapy. But a lot of those chemicals will impact the hormones, especially the thyroid as well. So chlorine is, is not a great thing to be exposed either. And that's why it is important to make sure you're drinking filtered water. By the way, chlorine acts like a 
uh, chlorine acts like a um, antibiotic, right? So it's yeah. killing off all the good microbiome in your gut, and then you're not getting um, getting all the good stuff there. It's also really close to iodine um, as far as its chemical nature, and so can affect the thyroid really significantly and lead to thyroid conditions, which of course is the master hormone regulator. So if thyroid is off, um, sex hormones often will then be disrupted as well. The other um, less commonly talked about source of xenoestrogens, though I want to mention is any source of combustion. Um, so cigarettes as well as diesel engines, um, even living near a freeway can be a, a really big health risk as far as toxic xenoestrogens in the body and certainly smoking, um, secondhand smoke, and then something called thirdhand smoke, which is when you're um, near clothing or materials that have been around um, cigarette smoke, all of those can be sources of xenoestrogens and a really big problem for um, women and men's health. Yeah, and you know, those, uh, those chemicals, people are very, sometimes very chemically sensitive. And to me, that's often a sign that one of those uh, detox systems in the body is not doing its job in kicking out the toxins. And so you're going to become more estrogen dominant as a result, as well as have other issues. So the liver, it becomes really important to address um, because of the exposure that we have from the chemicals, from our food and pesticides and all the stuff that we tend to use. You know, hair color is another one that we often forget about um, using breast cancer clean. risk. Yes, it has, especially the darker the hair color, the higher the risk for breast cancer. And so it's really important to use organic or as clean as you can hair color. It is very difficult to find clean hair color products, um, but um, at least you're reducing the toxicity when you get as close as you can. And, and there are a few salons around Seattle area that do offer cleaner hair products uh, from either Europe or here or um, Australia. So make sure that you are using hair, uh, clean hair products. It goes directly from the scalp into the system. So we need to really be careful with that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So detox, uh, any, any suggestions about how to detox some of yeah, this stuff? Definitely. So we talked about plant-based diet and fiber rich diet, but we also want to talk about the micronutrients that are important for both phase one and phase two. Um, detoxification. And so what's happening with phase one is that the liver takes fat soluble toxins um, and basically transform them, transforms them through something called cytochrome P450 enzymes. And those enzymes are basically a step in the reaction that happens in the liver that requires either vitamin B2, B3, B6, B12, folate, glutathione, or flavonoids. Um, and some combination of those usually. And so either oxidation, reduction, hydrolysis, hydration, or dehalogenation will happen in phase one. Um, and so foods that are rich in those B vitamins, as well as folate and glutathione can be helpful and flavonoids. And then phase two is the next process. And that is where the conjugation happens. And conjugation basically means your body takes this toxin that was transformed via the P450 enzyme and then sticks something on top of it. And then that tag tells the body to put that into the bile, which then goes into the um, gastrointestinal system to be removed through the stool. And so the nutrients that are needed for that step of the process are methionine, cysteine, magnesium, glutathione, B5, B12, vitamin C, glycine, taurine, glutamine, folate, and choline. <laughs> the list goes no on, right? <laughs> now, no you know, I, th I think it's really important to also say that not everybody needs all of those nutrients to detoxify because most of us have most of it. Sometimes we are um, not producing or making some of those nutrients or getting enough in our diet or, or are burning through it from chronic stress, like B, uh, B vitamins, the B5 and the B6 and the B12, we can burn through it if you're under a lot of stress, right? So it is very, very important to recognize that we don't necessarily need all of that, but we do need um, some of it. And that's one of the reasons it's really important to see a physician to figure out which nutrients are you deficient in um, that will help 
optimize your detoxification pathways. In fact, I love um, using uh, the Dutch hormone test. Not sure if some of you are familiar with the Dutch, but it is a urine test. It's a dried urine test. It stands up for dried uh, urine comprehensive um, test for hormones. And basically it is a very simple collection of urine on filter paper, and then you dry it up and send it to the lab. And it gives us an analysis of all those toxic estrogens and the good estrogens, as well as the progesterone and um, the cortisol and the adrenal hormones and all of these other hormones that play a big role in the way we process estrogen. And so uh, it also gives us actually the uh, byproducts of some of these estrogens, which is what I really love because we get an understanding of what nutrients you may be deficient in as a result or what detoxification pathway is deficient and, and what needs to be optimized, what needs to be cleaned out so that we can reduce your risk for cancer-related um, conditions. And this is really my biggest thing uh, with doing hormone balancing with females is uh, making sure that it's done safely. I see too many patients coming in here with just estrogen given to them and progesterone given to them. And some of them are synthetic. Some of them are put on chemical creams from the pharmacy and it's causing more problems for them. Some of them, their detoxification pathway hasn't been addressed. And so they're taking this estrogen and progesterone and then the liver is getting further bogged down and they feel worse on them. And you know, think about hormones. Hormones should make you feel great right? <laughs> they should optimize you. That's the whole point. They should help reduce the stress and help that bloating and the mood swings and the depression and the anxiety and all that. But if you're taking too much hormones and your liver can't handle it or your gut can't handle it, then guess what? You're going to get the backflow. And then we've got issues with um, more worsening of symptoms and reabsorption like you were talking about, Dr. Marion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 38% um, of women will develop cancer in their lifetime. That's a pretty big percentage. So yes, very much. We are looking at those toxic metabolites of estrogen and making sure that those are balanced and optimized um, so that that risk is, is lowered. Yes, yes. So um, then there is some herbs that we can use. Some yeah. nutrients. Well, we talked about the nutrients, but the herbs. Yeah. So as far as phase one and phase two or just hormone imbalance in general? Whatever you think we should talk about. <laughs> well, Vitex, I just want to mention, call, um, shout out to Vitex, Agnes Castus. Which Yay, is shout out. <laughs> um, and this really is a, a queen of women's health hormone herbs because um, it's really useful for a number of different conditions. Often we'll use it for polycystic ovarian syndrome, also for progesterone deficiency, um, which is often um, a root underlying issue with a lot of women's health conditions. And so that's an herb that um, if you do identify that there is a particular hormone balance that can be really beneficial in, in um, balancing the, the estrogen to progesterone ratio, as well as helping to support a regular 28 day cycle. Um, there's multitudes of other herbs, Shatavari, Dioscorea, Black Cohosh, really just tons that do really beautiful things in the body and herbs are interesting because um, they have 400 or more chemical constituents really they're quite complex so often they're not just doing one thing in the body they're not just pushing on one chemical pathway nature's really clever in the in that these plants actually have multiple actions on the body and the overall effect is balancing Whereas something like birth control is really pushing on one chemical and one pathway um, and that can create, create a lot of imbalance in the body. And we don't see that as much with herbs. Um, but as far as phase one and phase two metabolism goes, um, everybody knows milk thistle. And so that's a really big one that can support liver detox, but turmeric can be really helpful as well. Um, you know, we don't really get into all those choline, um, Artichoke. Artichoke. Yeah. <laughs> Artichoke. Artichoke is a great one. <laughs> Eating it and um, concentrated herbal form can be really supportive to the liver. Lemon water. <laughs> dandelion root. Actually, dandelion root oh, is yeah. really nice because it can be a nice yeah. substitute for coffee as well. And Especially help when there's um, 
bloating. Sorry, I lost sound for a second, but especially when there's water retention related yes. to the period. Yeah, so dandelion root for the liver and dandelion leaf for the water retention um, that helps the kidneys drain out the, the, um, the water. There's a question about, a couple of questions actually. One is what hair brand do you recommend? Well, that's a really tough one. Um, I personally have used the uh, herbal tint or the nature tint from PCC and Whole Foods, and they tend to be more cleaner than most of the other ones. I'm not necessarily a fan of henna. You have to be really careful with henna because the henna can be overloaded with metals and um, toxins. So be very careful with um, the form of henna that you choose. Then the other question is if I'm doing some Dutch, if I'm doing the Dutch test, and uh, I'm taking progesterone, should I stop the progesterone the week before? No, you don't need to stop any of your hormone creams before you do the Dutch test. You do need to stop any hormone creams that are, or any hormones that you're taking orally. So um, I hope that helps whoever's uh, asking about the Dutch test. By the way, hormone, hormones, we prefer them cream versus oral. And the reason is because especially estrogen and testosterone, when you take them orally, it bogs down that liver again. And, uh, and it can increase the risk of inflammation and uh, cancer. So we typically use the testosterone or the estrogen either as a cream or as a pellet. And most mm -hmm. people don't know about pellets, but pellets are the size of a grain of rice and they get inserted underneath the skin. And it's just a a five, 10 minute procedure, not very long. And we do that here. And they release slowly throughout the uh, month and to help um, the hormones. Typically, I don't do the pellets unless you're closer to menopause or menopausal, where we're not looking at the cycling of the hormones because it's almost impossible to cycle the pellets with uh, the, uh, or cycle the hormones with the pellets. But if you are consistently low, let's say progesterone throughout the whole month, then we may consider doing the pellets at a low dose uh, throughout the month to support the progesterone levels. Yeah. So this is, this is really awesome that we're getting so many listeners coming in from both Facebook and Instagram and uh, questions coming in. Please let us know if these conversations are helpful for you and if we should continue them. We put a lot of effort in trying to organize some of these things. So we'd love to get some feedback or if there's any particular topics that you're interested for us to discuss, we're more than happy to discuss them. So Dr. Marion, we're almost coming close to our 45 minutes time slot here. Anything else you'd like to share about any conditions or any words of wisdom that we have to share that we haven't yet? Um, well, I, yeah, I definitely um, feel the same that in, we are doing this for you guys in the audience, for you people in the audience. So if you have questions or particular topics that you would like um, discussed or addressed, then we welcome those ideas. And also we wanna make this an interactive experience. So if you have questions, please shout them out in the chats. Um, and this is really for you all, although we, we do enjoy just chatting away. So we're happy to do that as well. As far as women's health goes, um, of course, this can be a really complex area of medicine. Um, again, women and women's hormones can be complex. And so um, having the right person on your team that understands each and every one's, one of those complexities can be really helpful. And then having the right diagnostic tools um, rather than, for example, in conventional medicine, often if you go with any sort of pre-menopausal complaint, you get birth control, um, heavy bleeding, cramping, depression, um, acne, really the list goes on. If it's any sort of hormone related, the treatment is birth control. And I, I vehemently disagree with that as an approach to Me too. the, yeah, <laughs> to the, um, the divine, just, you know, the beautifully engineered body and, and the balances and checks and balances that we have in order to create a healthy system and, um, birth controls is not the answer and can be quite toxic. Of course, it's a, um, a necessary, um, 
tool for many women, but sometimes we need to work around that as well to make it less toxic. So just yeah. as a end on the birth control topic, but that's an uh, important well, I one. agree. I agree. And I do think it does increase the risk for uh, cancers and inflammatory conditions, autoimmune diseases long term. Um, and there are studies coming out showing uh, some of those um, issues. Um, any treatment for endometriosis naturally that you suggest? Yeah, so endometriosis is largely estrogen excess. And so everything that we talked about, about getting estrogen out of the body can be really valuable. And at some point in the um, disease progression of endometriosis, surgery is often necessary. Um, I wish that, that that was not the case, but at, at a certain point, sometimes it is. And then making sure that there is not a regrowth of the masses is really important so that there doesn't have to be multiple surgeries. But if you catch it early on and you balance the hormones early on and you create the um, or remove the obstacles to cure, um, we can keep the patient from having to get to the point where surgery is, is necessary. So, uh one other thing that I want to add to that um, is that endometriosis can be a symptom, not a disease necessarily. And so what I mean by that is that it can be a symptom of chronic infections and chronic inflammation in the body. And it is really important for uh, you, if you are suffering from endometriosis, to seek somebody who will look at the whole infectious part of all of this as well, uh, chronic disease, chronic infections, chronic disease, chronic inflammation, things like uh, chronic uh, tick-borne infections can play a role, um, viruses, chronic viruses like Epstein-Barr and cytomegalovirus and Lyme bacteria and all sorts of different um, chronic infections can cause more inflammation and more estrogen dominancy and then more endometriosis. So keep mm -hmm. in mind that some of these symptoms that you may be suffering from, whether it is PMS or menopause or endometriosis fibroids, those can be like a red alert, a yellow light alert saying, hey, something else is out of your, out of balance in your body. Let's take a look at those and let's uh, evaluate them. Autoimmunity uh, also plays a role, but autoimmunity can be triggered by another form of uh, toxin, like an infection or a chemical or something that triggers that switch. Um, if you guys didn't uh, listen to the um, Instagram live or the webinar on uh, social justice and uh, genetics, go back to uh, my website, drdarvish.com and listen to that because we talk about the epigenetics of how um, these environmental um, uh, experiences that we have, whether it's from food or emotional or um, uh, toxins, how they can act as a switch to turn on some of the genetic switches for some of these conditions like endometriosis and fibroids and how we can um, use that to unswitch, use your environment, the food that you take to unswitch. So that's a whole nother episode and we can expand on that maybe another time. Also, there is questions about using, uh, discussing more about Lyme disease and breast cancer and um, infections and all of that. We'll, we'll come back to that uh, in the coming weeks. Um, I think we'll end up talking about menopause um, next week because we really haven't touched on menopause yet. And my generation, at least, is going <laughs> through menopause. And so a lot of um, all, a lot of females have questions about hormones and menopause and symptoms and what can we do. So we'll probably end up talking about menopause next week and uh, and then headaches at some point and then look at some of these other chronic conditions that you guys all discuss. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening in. Please remember that this is for informational purposes and it's not meant to diagnose or treat or make any claims on anything. So uh, please make an appointment with your provider to seek a more personalized evaluation and treatment. And we love you and um, we're so grateful for all of you being out there and supporting us as we support you. So with that, I send you all my love. We send you love and we'll see you next week at noon. Take care. Bye-bye.